afternoon. Welcome to my podcast, Hidden Figures Behind the Numbers with the Restaurant Scientists. My name is Jason Wallace, and we're going to take an in-depth look into the economics of the food service and restaurant industry. I first need to start by giving a shout out to my sponsors, Cornerstone Business Labs, Cornerstone Productions, and Cornerstone Media. The objective of the show is to examine the economic disparities and inequalities impacting black food service professionals and restaurateurs. Our discussion will examine the financial data and the statistics behind the economics of blacks in food service. We will identify and expose racially biased pain points, detours, roadblocks, and rabbit holes. Our goal is to promote equality and help dismantle racial, racial bias in support of blacks for upwardly mobility to executive level jobs and entrepreneur opportunities. Uh, we will support and empower black food service professionals and restaurateurs by providing opportunities for greater visibility, access to funding and capital, and problem solving expertise. We live on the intersection of Opportunity Street and Resource Boulevard. Today's session, episode one, season one, is titled Celebrity Chefs. We will give a definition of celebrity chefs. We will talk about the mediums, television, radio, and print. We will talk about recognitions from awards, Michelin stars, James Beers, New York Times, Chicago Times, LA Times. And we will talk about the perceptional optics of the expert and the authoritarian uh, superiorism of once you have that title of celebrity chef, what does it mean? What, is, what does it send to the American public in terms of who you are um, and your, exp your level of expertise? Today, I'm honored to have two extraordinary chefs who I'm pleased and proud to call friends as well as colleagues. I have Chef Marvin Woods, a 20-year food service veteran in the hospitality and restaurant industry. Chef Woods began his career at Harris Trump Plaza in Atlantic City. He's worked at Rockefeller Center, the Sea Grill, Windows on the World, Arizona 206, Cafe Beulah, and Cafe Orbit. He also has led the helm in kitchens in London, England, and the Milestone Hotel in Savannah, Georgia. The National Hotel, both in Miami and in infamous South Beach, the Westin. Uh, he cooks as a personal chef and has cooked for a personal chef of Oprah Winfrey, Martin Lawrence, Jamie Foxx, Alonzo Mourning, and a host of families, celebrities, and dignitaries, including President Barack Obama. <laughs> That's a bad boy. Woods Consulting Arm, Mad Flavors, offers businesses his extensive experience and expertise on anything food and hospitality. He consults on restaurant projects of all phases in corporate and independent operations. Marvin Woods, welcome to the show. What's up, what's up, what's up? <laughs> Thank you. How's it going? Thank you for being on the show, Chef. Here now, this is it. All right, there's the clock. Here, here, here we go. So, my second guest is also distinguished Chef Timothy Dean. From dishwasher to highly regarded fine dining chef, Timothy Dean has learned values along the way. He has distinguished himself as a talented chef with an innate sense of preparing fine food and for never wasting an ounce of it for higher food cost. His first introduction to fine dining cuisine came on one of the finest restaurants in the country, a position as sous chef for Jean-Louis Paladin at Jean-Louis restaurant at the Watergate Hotel in Washington, DC. Throughout his career, he has learned the business and management skill sets necessary for restaurant ownership. Timothy Dean went on to open several restaurant ventures. The first was the Laguna Beach, was in Laguna Beach uh, with Norm Nixon and Denzel Washington. Next, he opened Paladin in New York City. And in April of 2000, Timothy launched his namesake restaurant in the St. Regis Hotel, Timothy Dean's Restaurant and Bar. It has been almost two decades since opening Timothy Dean's restaurant 
and Chef has gone to establish many more diverse restaurants throughout the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area, including Timothy Dean's in Bowie, Maryland. I welcome my friend, Timothy Dean, to the show. I got claps, I got the claps. Yeah, you got the claps, you got the claps. So, yeah. So, gentlemen, um, again, thank you for coming to the show. I'm honored um, that you're here and you know, my first show, which is obviously my inaugural show, is, is, is monumental to me. And the fact that you gentlemen decided to be on the show um, means, means the world to me. And I, and I really, truly thank you. Thank uh, you for having me on, man. I'm happy to be here. The, the goal now is for us to act like, you know, we're just talking amongst ourselves like we do, right? Like we like, do. Like, like, like black men, like chefs, like brothers. And it's funny, you know, because sometimes we can go years without seeing and talking to each other. But when we do connect, it's as if we just spoke yesterday. And Timothy brought that to my attention when we spoke a couple of days ago about the show. Um, so, gentlemen, um, today's episode is about celebrity chefs, right? <laughs> and I have a definition here of what a celebrity chef is, right? A celebrity, this is not my definition, I just pulled this from Webster's Dictionary, right? A celebrity chef is no ordinary chef, while a regular chef spends his time planning menus for a restaurant and preparing meals there. He or she travels the world to open new restaurants and promote cookbooks. Such a chef is likely to have at least one television show and a line of products bearing his or her name. So, you know, you and I, we all go back pre the Food Network, early 90s, late 80s. And at that time, being a celebrity chef was cooking for a celebrity, <laughs> right? 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 Such as Bill Cosby or Denzel Washington or someone like Patrick Ewing or those guys. Um, and then this industry was created. So I kind of want you guys to kind of dive in and talk to me and our, my listeners about your experience as a chef, um, pre-celebrity chefs as a new definition, and, 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 and post-celebrity chefs. Who would like to open up the floor? Well, Marvin's the senior here. Marvin's the senior. All right. So let's, <laughs> here you go, chef. I'll, I'll open up the floor. And, you know, um, I don't know when Webster wrote this definition but <laughs> even back in the day i felt that a celebrity chef was more than just somebody who um worked in a restaurant and had pr paid for them to get their name in a newspaper right. so you know as you guys know and as we gonna tell your your listeners etc right like when food network started we were some of the first cats mm -hmm. that got on food network and did multiple shows right you know Chef du jour, ready, set, cook, um, city news and views. Right. And the thing that used to crack me up was after a year or two of this stuff, people would, would come up to you in the street and think you actually had a show on the Food Network because they re ran the reruns so much. Right. And I was just telling a friend of mine today, like, we didn't even get paid for that. <laughs> <laughs> like, that, yo, mm. like free, mm. free, free. Crazy. That was that was go buy the food. Yeah, <laughs> come to the studio. Right, prep it yourself. Wow, shoot it. Yo, wow. So I mean, you had to buy you had to buy your own ingredients, your raw ingredients. You had to buy your ingredients. Wow, you had to buy your own ingredients. Chef Dean. And so, oh, I'm sorry. When I did my first cookbook, yep. Um, that's when I felt okay. The separation was okay. If you are building a brand or have your own brand that 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 stands you out separately from cats that are just cooking okay then now you can start thinking about calling yourself a celebrity chef or or you know right. traveling getting speaking gigs etc okay yeah that's legitimate celebrity chef in my mind but but right. guys that work for celebrities because a lot in in today's age they don't have a pedigree oh and by the way uh, you said 20 years but i got 30 years plus okay. and it's at this stage of the game yeah and so you know these these young people that are working for celebrities now they might have three right five years right. in the game they might have gone to culinary school they might have not finished culinary school like you know they they don't bring to the table what we bring to the table right okay td tell them <laughs> well, tell them you know I'm, I'm confused because you know ma with 
60 plus years and with Jason, that's almost damn near 100 years with the three of us. Like three, yeah. 100 years in hospitality, bro. 100 years combined. And <laughs> where I'm confused that who the hell do they think was cooking for 400 years? And you had right. these chefs in the White House on plantation. Right. I never forget, Edna Lewis sat me down uh, years ago when we used to do the, the dinners with Chef Randall. Right. And she explained to me where they came from. And mm -hmm. she's like, you know, you know how Edna was. Edna was mm -hmm. from the South. Mm -hmm. Great chef, had been chefing for many, many years. Mm -hmm. I was one of my mentors, is that um, she said this is their first generation of white chefs. Yeah. And the reason why they're entering into this field, is, and she brought up World War II, she said, they came after World War II, meaning right. they, the French, the Italians, uh, the Germans, all this food and all these neighborhoods that you have now with ethnic food. Right. That was not here when slavery was here. Right. Because the plantations was kicking right. and we was in there firing up them pots and pans. Yes, sir. And so it wasn't until after the Second World War and they, stayed, they came into our communities that this became lucrative. Now, yeah. it really became lucrative. And I think James Beard and Food Network, which going back to Food Network, Marvin was the one who called me and said, TD, I forgot where I was. I may have been with Jean Louis at the Watergate still. Yeah. Uh, or transitioning out. And he said, you need to go on and do these shows. They're looking for some chefs. And that was Ready, Set, Cook, okay. and Chef Dijor. Okay. So Marvin made the call to get me on the show. Right. Okay. That's how far we go back and right. even further. It, it, what has happened in recent times is it's become so damn lucrative. And I start seeing it in the, in, the, in the late 80s, early 90s, when these new chefs coming out of CIA, you know, right. and I start seeing the Caucasians coming in and thinking they knew how to cook and didn't know shit. Right. And working with Jean Louis and Gunter and all these guys, they stripped them down to nothing. Right. You know, you get in the kitchen with a real chef like that. John, I just I just remember CIA, he said CIA don't mean shit to me. Right. Right. Uh, and he would just, just embarrass him, bro. Right. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> they wanted to go over to a dish machine by the time he was done with them. Right. But what ended up happening is you look at look at how much money we was making 20 years ago, Marvin, as chefs. Yeah. 70, 80 was good money. Yeah. So yeah. now you're looking, these guys coming out 150, 200, 250. Look yeah. at what you Ray. Let's just take her for instance. Woman has never, we've been around way longer than Rachel Ray, correct? Way. We didn't even know who she was back in the day. Right. She comes along, Oprah gets behind her, never owned a restaurant, never worked in the kitchen, right. net worth 100 million and something. Mm, preach, brother. How the hell does that happen? Yeah. When you don't have one black chef to crack the top 20 or 30, I believe. Right there. Yeah. And so they systematically, when they say systematic racism, yeah. they systematically kept people who look like us that could cook better right. out of the system. Right. And now you have it to where it has just gotten totally ridiculous. Right. Because then you go on network and you don't see one black chef at all. And if they're on there, they're doing soul food. Right. <laughs> right. As if, that's as if that's all, you know, we could cook. That's it. That's they the box. You, networks, we want to get you on. I stopped doing James Beard Jenner. Are we going to bring you up Black History Month? What about the other 11 months? Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Network, can you do some soul food? Right. I'm saying, what the fuck are you talking about? Right. <laughs> right. No, nah, absolutely. Out, right? We're, no, it's raw. It's just, that's what well, it is. What are you, you talking about? Your classic, yeah. you broke up a little bit, Chef. So I just want to be clear to the yeah. listeners. What he said was, is that he's classically French trained, and yet he was being asked to cook soul food. Yeah. So, you know, I just want to make sure that they hear uh what 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 you said and that's a that's a huge part um because when you start looking at the numbers right right the, the numbers behind the celebrity chefs and their net worths um you know the first thing we have to talk about is intellectual property so i just kind of want to let you guys go so celebrity appearances speaking engagements private performances right uh product endorsements um, special events, corporate entertainment events worldwide. So, you know, when you guys were being exposed at that point, talk to my listeners about what happened and, you know, how come those things didn't parlay over into greater opportunities as if, you know, the definition said, at least one show and, and cookbooks and, and opening restaurants around the world. Did that any of that parlay over into either you guys um, being so, that you were both highly French trained and, you know, high, high end, high end chefs. So for me, I can, I can definitely say that, um, I, I've had a blessed and, and fruitful career. Yep. Now that being said, 
I'm not on that list that 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 you have in your possession that anybody can go see who the top celebrity chefs are. Right. Um, and and I make no concessions to say that to me is directly black specific. So my story okay. is this. Mm -hmm. So I have my first cookbook out, Turner <laughs> South, which is no longer around, but it, Turner South was. Uh, a network that Ted Turner started. So mm -hmm. for those people who know, know who Ted Turner is, if you know what CNN is and TBS is and TNT is, mm -hmm. then you know who Ted Turner is. Right. All right. So Ted Turner started a network called Turner South. He also owned the, he also was the owner of the Atlanta Braves. And so roughly around 2000, 2001, I was in Miami, had a restaurant called mm -hmm. M Woods. Mm -hmm. I get a call. Would you be interested in doing a show? Mm -hmm. Of course, they fly me up to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. I do the show. Um, show takes off. Got to the point where I was three years in doing this show. It's a mm -hmm. national show. Okay. Only African-American on television at the time with a national cooking show. Mm -hmm. Had 7 million viewers. Mm -hmm. So one day, an uh, uh, agent comes in mm -hmm. from New York mm -hmm. who lived near my restaurant. We talking. And in the restaurant, I always played footage of the show. And he's like, where is that? And I said, oh, well, I'll shoot it in Atlanta and tell him the whole deal. Speed up the chase. He goes, you should be on the Food Network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> 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 I said, but it's not going to happen. He right. said, well, what do you mean? Because once again, he doesn't look like us. Right. Well, what do you mean? Right. I said, man, that network has been up and running for nine years. They ain't never had nobody on there look like us, right. look like me. Right. Especially said, cooking I, that level of food. Okay. Right. He's like, I'll make some calls. He goes, I can get you a meeting with the with the with the vice president of, of programming. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, make it happen. Two weeks later, I fly to New York. Mm -hmm. I go to a meeting at the Food Network, and. Two people walk in the door, mm -hmm. the VP of programming and, and another cat. Mm -hmm. We get through the niceties. Hey, how you doing? Da, 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 all that good stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And we, so they go, um, so-and-so called, said, uh, you know, we should take this meeting, this, that, and the other thing. Well, what are you working on? So I tell I got a restaurant. I got a restaurant in Miami, white tablecloth, 80 seats. Right. Well, what kind of food are you doing? African diaspora. Mm -hmm. Eyebrow gets raised. Mm -hmm. What's that? So, okay, you're not familiar with diaspora. Right. So I'm going to drop some knowledge. Diaspora is a Greek word, means dispersal of people. Right. First time where it was used was used for the Jews when they left Palestine. I use it in terms of African people. Right. So the African diaspora is anywhere that blacks were transported to the Middle Passage. Right. And the also thing about the diaspora is it's the number of people is so great that they change and influence the area that they have now been put in. Right. So when you talk about South America and Central America and all through the Caribbean and the Southern parts of the States, right. you're talking about the African diaspora. Right. I said it pretty much that plain and simple right. as, you know, matter of factly. So he still had this look on his face of, you know, being perplexed. Right. I said, well, I brought a couple of menus. Look at the menus. Right. So he's looking at the menus. And, you know, I got duck, foie gras, yeah. lobster on the menu, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. And the whole thing is the influences, the seasoning, the flavoring, the marinades, they come from the African diaspora. Right. But I'm using all the same main proteins and ingredients right. that, you know, Tim and I and, and, and all the other chefs right. are using. Exactly. Yeah. Dude says... Don't nobody want to see this on TV? <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. I was like, I just got chills right yeah, now. Yeah. I'm like, wow. Okay. So now, you know, I'm I'm trying to hold myself. Yeah, exactly. Be, you Maintain know, that professionalism, composed, right? Be composed. Right. I I I double down and and try to sell some more. Right. And I'm getting pushback. Yeah. And in the pushback, I hear about diversity. Right. On the network. Well, that's when I lost it. Because yeah. I'm like, diversity. I said, yeah, you guys been running for nine years. Right. Where are you looking for diversity? Right. I'm like, I can give you five people off the top of my head. Right. Timothy Dean, Jason Wallace. Right. Uh, 
Marcus Samuelson. Right. Uh, yo. Yeah. Like, yeah. where are you looking? Are you so looking? if it ain't me, right. they're there. Yeah. Certified, legitimate, French trained chefs. Right. Real deal. Right, right. Um, after that conversation, I, I never got another call from Food Network. Wow. Wow. Chef Dean. Wow, wow, wow. Um, I, I've been blessed as well, you know. To, right. Uh, start off at the humble age of 14 and work my way up. Right. You know, by the time I was 19, was getting in a position to be John Lee's sous chef at the Watergate. Okay. And I would say a lot of doors were open because I was with him yeah. for, for many years. Uh, but those doors uh, has since, I think, shut down uh, after I left them. So I left, I uh, opened New York in, what was it, 96, 97, uh, Paladin at the time hotel. Okay. Right in New York, uh, Food Network approached me again, knowing that I'm doing French food. Okay. Stars in the New York Times. Would you be interested in doing a show with Southern food? How many stars? You had two stars in the New York Times? Yeah, two stars. We're two, in France. Two stars in the New York Times. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. And I said, I'm not doing Southern food. I'm, I, don't, I don't have anything against Southern food. I grew up on it, but I'm cooking French food. Um, so the doors have been open for me, yep. uh, so to speak, uh, but they haven't been fully open. Right. So I take someone like a Bobby Flay right. or, or, or uh, Boomgarden. What's her name? Emma Boomgarden, the one that's up in the Hamptons. Yep. We're yep. 40 something million. Mm -hmm. The doors haven't been open like that. Right. The right to raise. And so, the time has come now where I'm glad you're doing this because someone needs to get out here and tell the truth, just like Black Lives Matter. Yes. It's not just in the food industry. Absolutely. But this needs to be addressed and it's being addressed now, but they just seem like it's no regard for Absolutely. any of the stuff that we did in America, including being enslaved 400 years right, right, and not getting paid for it, including cooking all these years and coming up with great food and I'm very proud of soul food, right. okay? Our, our ancestors took something that was basically garbage. Right. How Scratch. they call it, chitlins, right. pigfoot, you, right. Know, right. The trout, the, the, you know, the snout. Right. And made a cuisine out of it. Yeah. What pisses me off today right. is when you take someone like, what's his name, Marvin? Sean Brock, right? <laughs> That's one Get of me them. started. And, and, and he, you know, he takes our food. Let's go. And marries it. Let's now, go. you didn't want to be married to this food growing up, I'm sure. But now you didn't divorce the white French food or whatever you grew up cooking and eating. Right. And you want to marry soul food. Right. And doors are just open. And, and come to find out, my man saying he's drinking so much uh, because I guess he's just laughing and got so excited that he's making so much money right. from cooking our food. Yeah. So even when we say, yeah, we'll go ahead and bend and do a little soul food, they still give people like that the Sean Brock's all the credit for yep. taking our food. Who's some of the other white boys out there um, that, and I ain't trying to be racist or not, that have been <laughs> no, taking out food that's what we're here to and talk got about. paid. I know, I just know of him because he's the one coming off the top of my damn head. Yeah, but yeah. I know there's other ones out there. Yeah, yeah, There's a lot of them out there. And 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 to that point, it's funny that you mentioned his name, but at the end of the day, my first book was written on low country cuisine. Right. I was in Charleston yeah. in 2000. Right. I wasn't getting I wasn't getting Sean Brock press. Right. Exactly. Right? And yeah. he comes along, he becomes the post child for, for Low Country. Right. Uh, like yeah. 10 years later. Like uh, how does that happen? How does it happen? Yeah. No, nah, and, and that's it, what it, you, so, it, so it's Chef D, you go ahead. I'm sorry. Say say what? It's called what, Chef? It's called white. <laughs> 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 man, you ain't wrong, man, dude. Man, You're not wrong. In 2000, and you didn't get one door open the way this man has had. Nah, man. There's another one in Baltimore who stole Low Country Cooking. It's, Georgia yeah. Brown's up here in D.C. Yep. It, yep. It's, am like, it's like, amazing. Really? It's amazing. Frederick Douglass said, and to go back to your slavery um, a comment in terms of how long we've been cooking, he told in his Negro Journal uh, newspaper, learn a trade or starve, right? Because I had st I actually started a company once called Lactose Communication, and I took it because he said that whites were beginning to enter into professions and jobs that were being paid that we used to do for free. Yeah. So a learn a trade or starve, you know, kind of goes back and speaks to that. So when we talk about the economics, which is what the show was about, uh, again, I want to highlight what the what, what what Chef Dean and Chef Woods are saying in terms of these. This talent is supposed to parlay itself over into intellectual properties that we can now monetize 
over and over again through residual income. So you're talking about in the courtroom, the judge is the authority, right? Because he or she is the most knowledgeable, right? In the operating room, it's the doctor. On these television shows, when I said earlier about the optics, what they're presenting is is that these celebrity judges, right, these celebrity chefs are actually the authority on all things food. Right. And when you don't see proper representation of African-Americans, of black and brown people on these shows presented optically as the authority, the authority and the knowledgeable ones, then it creates less opportunities for us and more opportunities for them in terms of judging and hosting these shows and these contests, intellectual properties, multiple restaurant operations, catering companies. These are all of the things that the top 50 uh, net, worth, uh, net worth celebrity chefs have gained. They have multiple restaurants. They have multiple intellectual property streams. They have multiple catering companies, licensing agreements with sauces and, 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 spe and seasonings and cookware and cookbooks and production companies and magazines. Um, and, and, and Chef Woods, didn't you uh, have some experience with Paula Dean's production company? Um, no, I definitely did not have any. Oh, okay. No. So... Uh, I did some stuff with Bobby and I did some stuff with, uh, with Guy Fieri, okay. but, uh, but not Paula never Dean. Paula Dean. All right. But she does have a production company from what I understand. She does. Okay. Well, that's the, that's how the Neely's got put on. Gotcha. But mm. so that's what, so after, after my conversation, it was another year, year and a half before there was any color representation that was on the network. And it was because <laughs> funny enough, because of Paula Dean's production company, but to me, that was some shucking and jiving and some buffoonery, and right. they weren't chefs. Right, right. Is this show right. still airing, uh, Mar? Say again? Is that the Neely show still airing on that? No, network? no. Oh, they snatched it. No, no, no. But they ran for you know four or five years. Yeah, yeah. right, right. But even but e even still in that, going back to what Jason just got finished laying out, they still weren't making the paper no. that right. the other folks are making. Right, yeah. like. Right. I mean, if you just think about, and I, because I went on Guy's show and I got to meet Guy and, and have a conversation with him. Right. I actually have respect for him, right? Yeah. I don't knock anybody's hustle. But at the end of the day, this is a cat who never owned a restaurant, came out of culinary school, won a competition for personality, and ended up getting four different shows on that network. <laughs> yeah. four, like four. four. Yeah. Dude, he had four different shows on it. Diners and Dives. Mm -hmm. um, grocery grocery games. games is his show, his production. And he had two other shows that he was doing. Mm. Okay. So these guys are making money off the production side and the talent and being the talent. Dude. So those are, those are and multiple. then going so back, to, going back to the ancillary numbers, money. We're talking about multiple revenue streams from being yeah. the talent and the executive producer and the production company. Continue going chef. back, going and going back to the ancillary money that you're talking about when you talk about being the the uh, the voice, having the optics of being an expert. Yep. I've been in events, man, and I, this is no lie. I the most I've ever gotten paid for a speaking engagement was ten grand. I've been in events where he, he's gotten a buck twenty five. Wow. For an hour. Wow. For an hour. Wow. That's what they get. Damn. Wow. Yeah. So let's. That's let, a big disparity. It is. Oh, yeah, it is. And, and what we're really talking about is microaggression and implicit bias, right? So these things, you know, I don't know if it's outright blatant racism, but it's so systemic that you are talking about microaggression and implicit bias. Um, let me just share with, with you. So this is based upon the top 50th, 50 richest celebrity chefs' net worth. Right between book sales, TV shows, endorsement deals, personal appearances, um, the top fifty. You got uh, I'm, I, won't, I won't necessarily go into names, but you got three hundred million. Right, three hundred million twice. You got you got two hundred twenty million. Right, somebody like all right. I, I'm gonna I'm uh, ask you the question. Yeah. Name the black person on there. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to on the top 50. Name, name, name <laughs> that got, person. That's got, who I want to know. You got Gordon Ramsay at 220. This is net yeah. worth, right? This is not the worth of their companies, right? Right. Uh, and their personal net worth, right? Yeah, this is personal. And again, I'm just, this is what I'm getting from this this website, Celebrity Net Worth. Uh, you know, anybody can Google this stuff. 
But mm -hmm. um, yeah, there 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 is no black person on the top fifty. List. Exactly, there's not one, and it stops. Exactly. At, it stops at ten million. So mm -hmm. when you get down to you know Alice Waters and Paula Dean and Tyler Florence and Alton Brown, you know those are the ones that are right around the ten million mark. So the only right. the most popular one that I know is a Mark and Samuelson. Exactly. You know, that means that he's below ten million. So the social, how crazy is that? The social distance between <laughs> the, the the white chef money and the black chef money is ridiculous and unacceptable. That's because so, we're with, still being paid slave wages, Jason. Yeah, yeah man, you talk. Or not getting paid at all. We're yeah. not getting paid at all. That's right. a slave wage. Right. Right. So you know it's it's amazing. Um, that you know, combined, these net worths are two point five billion dollars. Yeah, I'm gonna say that again. These are just top fifty celebrity chefs. Top fifty net worth, two point five billion dollars. We're talking. You're on the uh, the show with with the restaurant scientists, um, hidden figures, and we're we're taking an in depth, deep dive into the economics behind the food service and hospitality industry. In today's show, I have Chef Timothy Dean and Marvin Woods, and we're, we're talking about celebrity chefs and their experiences um, within the restaurant industry over the last 30-plus years. Chefs, let's unpack some more of this, man. Like, Got where, to. where do we go from here? Right? So we, we, we know that there's an issue. Um, we know that it's systemic. We know that we've been you know, excluded um, you know, how do we move forward? How do we make sure, you know, because, you know, we're all positive brothers and, you know, we really just want to, you know, we're going to be in the game for another 15, 20 years because, you know, we're really not that old. And, you know, 50 is the new 40 or 30. Um, what, how do we make sure that we're not in this position in 2025 that we are in in 2020? So I can tell you right now, man, this is um, not officially public as of right now, but I guess it's public now, but <laughs> I signed on with, a, I signed on with a cat here in, in Atlanta to do a project, man, that I'm, I'm pretty happy about and excited about. And, and the project is going to be called rebels coffee house and market. Okay. And, um, it's about going back into our communities. Okay. It, it's about, um, teaching, mm -hmm. giving back mm -hmm. inky baby businesses. Mm hmm and educating. So let me break it down. We're going to set up a, a, a market. I'm doing a full on butcher shop, um, produce market, fresh eggs, the whole nine yards. Okay. Um, all the food is sourced by black hands, meaning all the farmers that we get food from is from black hands. Awesome. We partner, we partner with a high school called Washington high school, which is a, which is a, uh, tech high school here in Atlanta. Okay. That has a culinary program. So, you know, we, we talk about what we do. Um, there's a lot of chefs that don't know how to butcher. That's a lost craft. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's a lost craft. Right. So Absolutely. I'm bringing in sides of beef. I'm bringing in a whole pig. I'm bringing in, you know, livestock and going to teach these young people how to butcher. Absolutely. Because that's a lost craft. Yeah, absolutely. And... I'm driving this from a market standpoint. So we partnered with the USDA. I'm in the process of getting my HACCP certification because <clears throat> we will use food stamps. Okay. So if you, if you live in this community, we're on MLK. Okay? okay. So if you live in the community, you get a community card. So if you look like us, you come shop, you can use your food stamps to get okay. real whole food. Okay. okay. Right. There's an education component to that, too, yeah. because I've always said that the reason why people of color lead in all health disparities in this country, 50 percent of that, if not more, is because of lack of education. Oh. If you're not educated on what to eat, you're not going to make changes. You're not going you're not going to do. You don't feel like you have any options or choices. So right. you're just going to be in that box and do what you do. Right. Right. Okay. Perfect example is two blocks down the street from us in this neighborhood is a Walmart. I'm sorry. Walmart's not a grocery store to me. Right. But that's what they give us. Right. So we got to go back into our communities and, and inject all of this food, education, incubate jobs, teach young people how to do this, man. Because whether it's COVID or not, the one thing that is constant, 
people got to eat. Right. They ain't got to eat at a restaurant. Right. But they got to buy food. Right. No, absolutely. So, that's good work. You got, Jeff. You, got you got to go from the you got to go from the ground up. That's good work. How do people get in touch with you? Uh, Chef Marvin Woods at Gmail is is uh, my email address. All my handles on every social media, Chef Marvin Woods, IG, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, all Chef Marvin Woods. Okay. Um, and, you know, I'm, 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 I'm about to change the game with this. Yeah. Because we're going to do multiple cities with this concept. Yeah, that sounds like wonderful work. Chef Dean, how do we move forward? I think, uh, and, and, and kudos, Marvin. That is beautiful. And I look forward to coming down there and supporting you with that. Uh, Thank you, my brother. And, and, and joining in and grabbing my knives, which... Some of these exactly. millennials don't even have knives <laughs> and help and show them that you got to start with a knife That's it. Uh, and, and, and help you with some butchering, my brother, and some filleting some fish so they can learn. There uh, you go. Where do we go? Right now that what the world is seeing, not just America, right. is in my opinion, personally, God is pissed off. Okay. And with the restaurant industry, all these guys that I work with throughout the years, the air repairs, uh, the Daniel Baloods, all these guys that have been in that circle that I've seen are all taking a hit right now right. with coronavirus. Yep. I think right now is, is epic because it's leveling the playing field. Yep. Because so many of them guys are not going to be able to come back with their multiple restaurants that this is a time with the, uh, we're calling it the restaurant purge. Yep. Position yourselves to get ready, get your business plan together, get your numbers together, get your skills together, because banks and landlords are going to be looking for tenants and banks are going to be looking for real estate to sell. Absolutely. How do we move forward? The hell with leasing somebody else's space, going in, building it out, mm -hmm. putting all this beautiful equipment in there, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you default and your black ass is in court with a confessed judgment. Mm -hmm. Trust me because I know because I've been through it and I spent thousands Preach. of dollars. Right, Ma? Thousands of Preach. dollars. Thousands of dollars on attorneys to get out of these deals. Yes, exactly. Um, so plan on buying your real estate if you want to go into it. Yeah. And secondly is millennials. Get your shit together, okay? Yeah. You have to work those 70 and 80 hours. Yeah. And for white people, too. <laughs> you coming out of culinary school and you don't know shit. Yeah. But you're getting the opportunity because of disparity and the racial gap that you have money or your parents have money or redlining with banks, they'll give you that loan that they won't give us, right. okay? But right. you still have to run the restaurant. Right, yep. Where right. I'm heading now is I'm going more, we're taking, we temporarily closed Bowie location. Okay. And they're still trying to negotiate because I'm saying, why would I give you 10,000 when I can spend a thousand and sit down with Whole Foods, which I got in one hour to right. go and do my sauces and soups with them. And they're looking for licensing agreement people to go in. There's more, what, what we've done, Jay Wallace and Marvin is we kind of got, because we're ancient. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not ashamed to say that. We're in our 50s. <laughs> is we grew up in the restaurant industry. Yeah. There we so have. That's what we know. Yeah. That's what we were sticking to. Yeah. Yep. But it is a tough business. Yep. One or two restaurants is not going to make you rich. Nope. It's too much cost involved. We now have to pivot yep. and focus on TV shows. Let's go knock on the damn door to Food Network, Sam, let us in. Absolutely. Okay, let's go knock on the doors of the bank and say, let us in. Absolutely. We've been here. We're right. just asking for the opportunity. We're not asking yep. for no damn favors. Right. Don't want no hand out. No. no, since we only know restaurants, that's what we do, guys. Yeah. Yeah. We are learning to pivot. I'm now focused on Marvin. I'm just focusing on sauces. Yeah, I'm focused. Cook, cook, and yep. now licensing agreement because yep. we're not getting any younger. I was telling you, I can't sit back and do 80 hours a week right. cooking behind the stove no more. Them days are behind me. Yes, yes, sir. And Absolutely. moving forward, we have to, as, as Marvin pointed out, educate ourselves not on just feeding our stomach, but we got to start feeding the most important muscle in our body, the brain. My brain. Yep. Absolutely. So that's where we go, in my opinion, is look at multiple things that are out here. Because look at in our 50 years that we that I've been on this earth, guys, right. I've never seen anything like this in the restaurant industry. No. Right. Well, we're sitting back waiting on a on a government that has Trump in it to give us some money to survive. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. I rest my case. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, when the sauces are ready, you got to send them down because I put them on the shelf, man. Yes, sir. You know what I'm saying? Chef, how do, Chef Dean, how do people get in touch with you? Uh, TimothyDeanBooey.com. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, and all that stuff is Timothy Dean Restaurant. Uh, yeah, I'm not even a big computer guy, so I'm, I'm right. just learning all this stuff. I'm glad <laughs> I got on Zoom and y'all can see me. Uh, but yeah, Timothy Dean Booey is the uh, 
website, and then Facebook, Instagram, and uh, any other gram is Timothy Dean Restaurant. Got it. I got it. And we'll double back on that. And again, my, to my listeners out there, you're on uh, behind the behind the scenes with uh, behind the numbers with the restaurant scientists. I have executive chefs Timothy Dean and Marvin Woods here. And Chef Dean, you brought up on on a very important point in terms of these leases versus real estate, and which is one of the reasons why. So my experience was coming out of the CIA. Um, I now have basically, I have not basically, I have three degrees in food service and restaurant industry. That's all that, that's um, nice. Thank you. Thank you. The, thank the, you. The hands are cheering. The editor fell asleep with a chair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got to get the. Oh, they, they didn't hey. fell asleep for it. Yeah. Ah, there it is. There it is. There it is. <laughs> okay, right. So, you know, the culinary arts degree, you know, the bachelor's in restaurant management and the master's in food business. And one of the things that is really important that you said is understanding the real estate game. About yep. 10 years ago, I started, um, I actually I bought a commercial property, and that's kind of how I learned the real estate game and mixed shoes. I had a bar and liquor store downstairs and six apartments over top. And that's when I decided to go back and actually get my real estate license. So, you know, for the last 10 years, I've been licensed in both New York and New Jersey in terms of of commercial real estate. And what I'm seeing is, like you said, many chefs are going into raw spaces, vanilla box spaces. They're building it out for the landlord. Um, and the problem is, is that the landlords are greedy, right? And uh, un unwilling to understand that the restaurant industry is not a retail business, right? It's not Walmart. It's not Walgreens. It's not Macy's. It doesn't sell sneakers, right? Where in those businesses, they don't manufacture anything. What they do is they buy already prepared goods and they resell them. In the restaurant industry, we manufacture, right? We take in raw products in the back door, right? You're bringing in vegetables and proteins and you're manufacturing them into an end product while simultaneously marketing it to the end consumer. So a retail lease is really not applicable to a restaurant um, because of the margins, the cost, the food cost, the labor cost, those margins are totally different. So it is important that as we go forward that restaurateurs really understand the real estate market and in those situations where you can buy and build, you're better off. And as you said earlier, Chef, the, as a result of the, po the COVID purge, post-COVID, I would say by next summer, um, there will be a plethora of second generation restaurants on the market ready to be taken over at 25 cents on the dollar. So now the exhaust kitchen hoods are already there. The electrical, the plumbing is already there, which, you know, you know, what costs you over $200 a square foot to build from scratch. Um, yep. So one, we need to join a coalition and you can come to my website, um, restaurantscientist.com. And there's a, there's a coalition that uh, we're going to join where you can get access to uh, cutting edge uh, research, um, webinars, seminars, and other educational materials, as well as access to Chef Dean and Woods' programs that they're doing. But we, you know, we're, we're uniting as, as an industry of black professionals to kind of speak up about what, is, or, you know, what are intellectual properties, patents, copyrights, trademarks, trade secrets, and rights of publicity. Uh, what are licensing deals? And more importantly, how do we parlay our, our skill sets over into generating revenue so that we truly can build wealth and we can narrow the social distance gap between uh, white food service professionals and black food service professionals? Um, chefs, this has been so exciting. I actually, uh, you know, we, we, we got to do this again. We got to do this some more. As we, love to. as we wrap up, any any final, give me final words from 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 both of you gentlemen. Well, man, I, I want to thank you for allowing me to be on. I think, you know, what you what you're doing, what you're working on is is much needed. Thank you, TD. You know, I love you, man. I'm glad to see you and and keeping in the fight and and love you back, brother. Yeah. There's there's strength in numbers. Absolutely. So we got to keep this dialogue going. We got to keep pushing the envelope. Yeah. Uh, we got to keep. Uh, banging on the doors and trailblazing. Yep. Absolutely. And trailblazing. Absolutely. Got to. Right. This is a social mission. Uh, and, and my soul is not happy right now. Um, so this is really about advocacy for me. It's really yeah. about advocacy. Chef Dean, the parting words. First off, uh, Jay Wallace, thank you. Like I said the no other problem. day, we can pick up the phone and it could be 10 years. We yeah. can pick up where we left off without missing a beat. Absolutely. Uh, honored to be on with my brother, Chef Dan Woods. 
what I would like to see is we got to keep this dialogue going. Yeah. But just like the Black Lives Matter movement came along. Yep. I remember BCA, Black Culinary Alliance. Yes, um, sir. Back in the day, was very proud to to be involved in that. Is yes. we got to come up with something new now, guys, and yeah. we got to come up with something on a uh, something that's mass like Black Lives Matter, Black Chefs Matter, absolutely, Black Customers Matter, right. and go and knock on the door of Food Network, right, and 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 be determined to sit back and I can get I can get Joe Madison on this, I can get a lot of people on it, right, uh, as far as media and TV is concerned, okay, to look at the disparities that we're going through right now. And now is a good time because everybody's crying. You got the, the black chefs that have been haven't been crying, but just sitting there holding out, holding out peace. But if you look at Thomas Keller and all these guys sitting at the White House trying to get money. Right. Everybody's hurt right now. Yeah. I think it's an opportune time to level the playing field. Absolutely. Totally. Totally agree. Three hundred twenty-eight million people in the United States population. Thirteen percent of those are black. You're talking about forty-two million people. And, uh, you know, we, we have to get behind these numbers and really understand the economic impact of owning and operating our own businesses and having access to capital. Um, TD, you're absolutely right. Chef Marvin, you're absolutely right. I don't know if black media exists anymore or, it, you know, media has changed so much. Um, but, you know, we've always been collectively not jealous of each other, even though as chefs we're very competitive. But, you know, we've always been united. And I want to thank you brothers for that. Um, you know, there's no jealousy, there's no envy. And, you know, when some other black chefs were afraid to be black, we didn't even, that's a whole nother show, right? Uh, show. And when we, when we was doing our thing in the 1990s, then you had some black chefs out there that's like, no, I don't want it, I'm not black, whatever. I was gonna, you know, I ain't going to say what I was going to say after that. But, you know, now, <laughs> here we are, you know, we've been proud to be black and to be chefs and highly trained chefs at what we do. And we're going to continue that. And any of those other, um, you know, chefs that now want to be black, you know, we, we you know, we always going to, we're going to let you back in. You know what I mean? Yep. We, we don't get down like that because it's bigger yep. than us. This is about advocacy. This is about a social mission um, that, you know, we need to do for the next generation of, of black food service and hospitality professionals. And let me also say, we're not excluding our Hispanic brothers out there. So when we say black, we really mean any of the Caribbean uh, yep, nations, exactly. right? So we're including all Caribbean nations. Um, so, you know, just, just so, you know, for our Hispanic brothers and sisters out there, you know, we're not excluding you. It's just in terms of us, you know, it, it, you know either you're black or you're not. <laughs> you right. know what I mean? So, uh, you know, that's the way we get down. Um, we welcome everyone with open arms, and we're just trying to help ourselves, you know, before we can help anybody else. Amen. All right, gentlemen, um, again, I want to thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank, again, my sponsors, which is Cornerstone Business Labs, Cornerstone Productions, and Cornerstone Media. I want to thank my audience for tuning in, and you know, just just keep us posted. You know, keep keep following us. Uh, we're going to keep bringing back these shows with these in-depth conversations about the economics and the state of blacks and food service. My name is Jason Wallace, the Restaurant Scientist, and you are experiencing hidden figures behind the numbers of the food service and hospitality industry. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Black power. Black power. Black Wall Street.